Hey guys, um, welcome to Platitube again. Uh, today I'm kind of, kind of, kind of going to do an economic history overview. So I'm going to move really quickly chronologically through um, the progression of government involvement in the economy. And I'm going to start in the 1870s because that's essentially where this course starts. And um, in the 1870s, we're going to get um, the ideology of laissez-faire. And laissez-faire is an ideology supporting a hands-off approach. Laissez-faire literally means, I believe, hands-off. So whenever you think about laissez-faire, lift your hands, because that's, that's what it is. But it's an ideology supporting um, hands-off approach to business and capitalism. And basically, this means that capitalism is completely unrestricted. In the late 1800s, a new theory developed from Charles Darwin's theory of evolution, and it's called social Darwinism. And it's the belief that individuals could genetically pass on their learned, not genetic, but learned characteristics to their children. Um, that's, I don't think that's actually possible. Um, the fittest persons inherited such qualities as um, industriousness, frugality, um, the desire to own property, the ability to accumulate wealth, and the unfit inherited laziness, stupidity, and immorality. So it was actually social Darwinists who coined the phrase survival of the fittest. Not Charles Darwin himself, but social Darwinists. And they saw the government's intervention as encouragement for laziness and vice. Um, most objected to public school systems since it forced taxpayers to pay for education of other children or other people's children. He, they opposed laws regulating housing, sanitation, you know, like going to the bathroom and water and all that stuff, and health conditions because they interfered with the rights of property owners. Not the rights of people, not the rights of man, but property owners. Um, in the economic arena, social Darwinists advocated a laissez-faire system that tolerated no government regulation of private enterprise. Um, they saw taxation as confiscation of wealth and undermining the natural evolution of society. <laughs> And they assumed that business competition would prevent monopolies and would flourish without tariffs or any other type of government restrictions on free trade. Uh, they argued against legislation that regulated working conditions, uh, maximum hours, minimum wages. They basically said that that is a violation of um, property rights of employers because the employers are the ones that are the fittest and the employees are the unfit. Those are the lazy, immoral people that have to be kept in line. So if they can't, you know, keep up to snuff, then if they die, they die. Who cares? <laughs> um, so from the 1870s to the early 1900s, America was experiencing this, this rapid industrialization, laissez-faire capitalism, and no income tax. No income tax. Which I've already talked about as far as the industrialization and the laissez-faire capitalism. But the income tax, let me briefly talk about that. That's not going to occur until later. Because at this point, the government is, the taxes that um, the government is, are bringing in they're from imports and exports. They're tariffs. They are um, trade taxes. There, there's, not a, there's no income tax. Now, um, this time period from the 1870s to the early 1900s is often referred to as the Gilded Age. This is a phrase coined by Mark Twain. And Mark Twain is a satirist, meaning that he writes satire or is very sarcastic to put it in, you know, like normal terms. And he basically said that... There were extreme differences in, um, well, okay, so we called it the Gilded Age because when something is gilded, that means that it is gold-plated. On the outside, it's shiny and pretty, and it looks like it's precious, and it looks like it's expensive, and it looks like it's worth something. But if you break it open, it is just cheap material on the inside. It's like the jewelry you buy from Charming Charlie's, and or... Um, the jewelry that you buy, that you get from the bubblegum machine, and it comes out and you put it on your finger and an hour later it turns your finger green. Um, because it's cheap and rotten. 
And that's why he called it the Gilded Age. Not because he thought it was a golden era, but because he thought it was superficial. Um, there were extreme differences in wealth and extreme differences in the access to what is known as the American dream and that ability to move from rags to riches. Not everyone had that. Workers' wages and working conditions were unregulated. Millions of men and women and children worked long hours for low pay in dangerous factories and mines. I mean, like, their life sucked. If you weren't a gazillionaire, if you weren't one of those captains of industry that I've talked about, or those robber barons, and that's why they're called robber barons, by the way, because they made their billions on the backs of poor people. So, you know, what's going to end up happening is that this laissez-faire capitalism is actually going to create big business monopolies. It's actually going to create greater economic instability. So a hands-off approach to the um, economy, it, it helps the bottom line which is what economics is all about. It's the bottom line. It doesn't matter. The ends justify the means. It doesn't matter how you get there as long as you're making billions of dollars. So like JP Morgan is reported to have at his height to have controlled $30 billion in the 1890s, which translated today would be $7.3 trillion. JP Morgan at one point was worth $7.3 trillion. That's insane. And there were people who were dying in the streets at the same time and their bodies were being left there because there was no public works that would even clean the streets. It's crazy. So what's going to end up happening is um, labor movements are going to start being created. A labor party is going to be created based off of socialist values and everyone's going to start freaking out because we don't want to be socialist. We're a democracy. We're, we believe in capitalism. So what we're going to do out of fear of like a Marxist revolution is we're going to look to the government during the progressive era, which is going to start early 1900s and go till, till World War I. And um, this fear of Marxist revolution is um, going to allow the government to get involved and actually start creating some um, regulations to regulate capitalism. Now, we're going to create antitrust laws, most notably the Sherman antitrust law, which is going to make monopolies illegal. Now, what's going to end up happening, because it's such a simple, black and white, straightforward law, there are so many loopholes. Because it doesn't talk about things like mergers and acquisitions. So what they're, they're going to continue to create trusts or monopolies through mergers and acquisitions, right? So it's actually not, the Sherman Antitrust Act is not going to gain any teeth until 1913 with the Clayton Antitrust Act and that bad boy Woo. It creates the Federal Trade Commission and it prevents monopolies, it prevents um, anything that's going to limit competition. That's the law that's really going to say if you control more than 25% of the market, then you know what? You are in violation of trust laws. It's pretty awesome. Okay, so also in 1913, we are going to create a Federal Reserve Bank, which is going to become our national bank. Um, we haven't had a national bank since the 1830s. And in the 1830s, when we abolished, the, from the 1830s, from when we abolished the national bank to 1913, we had gone through this huge, um, very unstable time period because we would, we would go to extremes. We would have a huge boom and then a, a very horrible bust. And it was back and forth and back and forth. It was like this vacuum almost of constant fluctuation. And there was very little stability. So the Federal Reserve is going to provide that. It's going to um, provide stability to our money supply. It's also going to give some power over the money supply because they are going to um, create what is called monetary policy. And I'll get into monetary policy in a later video. Um, but it's that kind of economic stability is going to do wonders until, of course, we know what, what's coming in, the, in 1929, right? 
Um, also at this time, we've got the 16th Amendment is passed. The 16th Amendment is the constitutional amendment that says the government has the right to tax your income. And this is going to be a huge boon for um, government funds and government spending. The income tax is going to bring in so much money people start to get upset about how much money it brings in the government. Um, you also want to look during the progressive era at trust busting presidents. So you've got Teddy Roosevelt and he had what was called the square deal. Um, and part of his square deal is he wanted to make sure that people were taken care of but so were companies that were doing the right thing within the economy but also for their people. So. Um, Teddy Roosevelt believed in categorizing monopolies or trusts, and he basically labeled trusts as good or bad and um, decided whether or not to go after them. And Teddy Roosevelt will forevermore be known as the trust-busting president. Now here's the crazy thing. The guy that comes after TR, or Teddy Roosevelt, his name is Taft. He was kind of a quiet guy kind of mild-mannered or seemingly mild-mannered, but he was the real trust buster. He didn't categorize. If you were a trust, he was coming to get you. And he, in his, um, in his tenure as president, he busted 90, 90 major monopolies. He went after him. He's also going to become a Supreme Court justice after being president, so he really does believe in, um, in in interpreting the Constitution and enforcing the constitutional law. So that's why he was all about going after that. But he's not known as a trust buster because, well, Teddy Roosevelt's a lot more fun. <laughs> um, and then Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, pre-World War One. you know, World War One is going to become all-consuming for Wilson, but pre-World War One, Wilson is really going to go after trying to make the workers or the laborers' life better. So his He's going to try and push through all kinds of legislation um, that's going to create minimum wages and maximum hours and um, workman's comp, which, you know, sounds like if you get hurt at work, you actually get taken care of. It's pretty cool. Some other ways that the government has gotten involved in business during this time, we've got the um, Pure Food and Drug Act. So that's that thing that makes sure that all of your food is labeled properly. <laughs> You know, so that you know you're eating what you're eating. Um, because before, like, if you had canned food, there was no label. I mean, there was, but there was nothing regulating to make sure that the label actually matched the content. So you could have been buying peaches, canned peaches, and then you open it up and you've got potted meat that had been spoiled and then resold as peaches just to get it off the shelf. Gross. Right? Um... There's also the Meat Inspection Act. If you ever get the chance, read Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, um, even an excerpt, and there are there's some crazy stuff. So originally Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle as a way to um, talk about the immigrants' uh, working conditions in, these, in the meatpacking industry, and what he ended up show, showing, or what he ended up highlighting was, the, was everything that was going into our meat because the meat wasn't being inspected, because there was no FDA, there was no USDA stamp approved, you know, stuff. No, no. So like, for instance, if, um, let's say a worker at the meat packing plant was, you know, sending all of this meat, mystery meat for all they knew and calling it beef, um, and, through a grinder and one of their fingers happened to get caught and it got cut off and it like went through the grinder, they're not going to throw out all that meat. No, no, no. Human finger, human remains were found in the meat. Um, animal remains, animal feces. D disgusting. Disgusting stuff. Okay? So, um, it's gross. Anyway, so... The Meat Inspection Act, the Pure Food and Drug Act, that's also your prescriptions to make sure that you're actually getting something from your doctor, those medicines, you know, not snake oil or whatever. All right, so in the 1920s, uh, we've already talked about this. 
Um, but the 19, just as a refresher, the 1920s Republicanism, um, it was a reversion back to laissez-faire. Um, we turned internal. You know, we after World War I, we became very isolationist, and we wanted to make sure that we were taking care of ourselves, and we are having a grand old time. And there was very little um, government regulation, once again, except for when it came to um, radical ideology and dissenters, those people were government regulated, um, most notably socialists and members of the labor party. So labor unions, the people who were actually trying to fight for the worker, they were imprisoned and deported and fined and whatever. You know, and the courts backed up the businesses. So the government supported business by backing them up in legislation and in um, court cases. So is that really not involved? That's, is that really laissez-faire? If you're getting involved, you're just not hindering business. You're hindering the worker. You make the choice. I don't know. Then in the 30s, Right, we've got, um, we start the New Deal because of the Great Depression, because of unrestricted capitalism in the 20s. Um, we had unregulated speculation in the stock market and unchecked buying on credit, and nobody could pay their bills, and so we had a major economic collapse, and we entered the most prolonged economic contraction in U.S. history. Um, again, I don't know if unchecked capitalism, if laissez-faire is really the way to go. I know that total socialism is not the way I want to go either. I'm just saying, maybe a middle ground. Um, because totally unchecked, Great Depression. I don't know. Anyway, so what, out, what was seen as out of necessity, the government will take over the economy. And I mean take over. And so this will forever from this point forward, from the 1930s to today, it will change the government's role in the economy and it will have a huge impact, right? So, you know, then we have the 1950s, you know, a time of consumerism and Eisenhower and his modern Republican, re Republicanism. And he, you know, he doesn't make any major changes to the New Deal, however, so he leaves all those wonderful government programs. He gets rid of a few, but not very many. But then at the same time, so that makes the Democrats happy, right? But at the same time, um, he lowers taxes, so that makes Republicans happy. <laughs> um, and he only balances the budget three times in eight years. It's actually written into law now that the president has to balance the budget every single year. But three times in eight years, and because he kept government programs and decreased taxes, that means we have a deficit budget because spending is greater than taxes. And it's the first time we start accumulating debt, really. So national debt balloons due to Eisenhower's policies. So we got to figure something out, right? That's what your economic policies are all about. In the 60s, and I'm going to go into this one in a lot greater detail in a later video, um, but this period in the 60s is marked by an expansion and even an overextension of government funds and um, or government spending and their role in the distribution of public goods. So it's, it's going to be kind of a guns and butter approach, and that will make more sense when you get to the other video. Um, in the 70s, it's marked by a period of major economic instability that we call stagflation. Um, it's due to um, economic turmoil, and turmoil internationally, and the U.S. will uh, basically experience what is called an abnormal contraction, in which we have high unemployment and high um, inflation. Now, usually in the business cycle, you either have one problem or the other. You don't usually have both. But in a, stag in a period of stagflation or in an abnormal contraction, you have both high prices and high job loss. So even the people with jobs can't really afford to buy anything. 
Um, so the entire economy in the 70s is, um, to put it nicely, lackluster. Um, and to put it not nicely, it's in the crapper. <laughs> So 1980 rolls around, Ronald Reagan is going to take over, um, and he is going to get with the leading economists of the time, and they're going to try and figure out a way to deal with stagflation, and they're going to come up with a way, and their way will um, supposedly decrease government involvement in business, decrease government involvement in, um, or decrease government regulation, decrease business taxes, um, decrease government spending just in general. And so all of this, what this is supposed to do is allow businesses to expand their um, capital resources so that they can then um, expand their businesses themselves so that they can then hire people and create jobs. And those people with jobs now have a paycheck and they can go and buy stuff which the businesses will then have to produce more stuff and it becomes this cycle, right? And so it, this, this type of approach is going to be called Reaganomics. Um, it's going to be disparagingly called a couple of different things, trickle-down e economics, um, in which you give everything to the wealthy and then it's supposed to trickle down to the poor. Um, I don't know if that works, but it did for a time. Um, it's also known as voodoo economics because you're just, strangely enough, voodoo e Reaganomics was called voodoo economics by Reagan's vice president when he was running against Reagan in the 70s. It's really interesting. It's good stuff. Um, uh, we're going to experience um, a very short period of prosperity because of this approach during the 80s, but by 1987, we're going to hit an economic, a major economic recession, and we're going to hit another one in 1992. Um, and then Bill Clinton's going to come into office. He's going to be a moderate Democrat, and economically speaking, I don't want it politically, whatever. Economically speaking, he's going to be a moderate Democrat. He's going to work with the Republican Party. He's going to um, help write the contract with America, um, with Newt Gingrich, who was, you know, the leading Republican congressman. And they're going to basically try and find a middle road. And things are going to be great. Things are going to be great until a certain period. Um, and after that, we know that things are going to happen where, economically speaking, things are going to go back and forth again until 2008 when we hit the Great Recession. And you guys have lived through that, so you know what that means. All right, so that was a very quick, very down and dirty kind of overview of economic history. There will be a lot of other videos along the way that are going to fill in some details on quite a few of the decades that I haven't covered yet. So I'll see you then.